Hello and welcome to this panel as part of the Dark Hedges Film Festival. My name's Darren and as part of this part of the festival this year, we're delighted to be showing Blade, the 1998 super horror or sorry, superhero horror film directed by Stephen Norrington, starring Wesley Snipes. It's going to be shown on Saturday the 30th of October at seven o'clock in Movie House Cinema's City Side. And sort of despite mixed reviews on its release, the film is sort of seen as a a cult classic and you know it has an upcoming marvel cinematic reboot starring mahershala ali on the cards we think it's great timing to be sort of taking a deeper look at the history and the character of blade so joining me now is the always insightful aaron flanagan hello aaron hi there hi how's it going so aaron is the co-founder of comic book guys the comic book store in belfast north ireland so Look, Aaron, might as well just get started. For those of us who maybe haven't seen Blade or haven't read any of the, the Marvel comics, can you give us a bit of a like an introduction to the character of his origins on the page? Uh, so Blade, he's a character that, to be honest, you know, as I say, when I was growing up, he wasn't really prominent in many of the runs. Now, he appeared in some sort of some of the runs that I was reading, but as a character, he was just there or thereabouts. He was always in the fringes. But obviously, you know, as I got a bit older, I started to delve into characters who were a wee bit darker. And obviously, you know, Blade the Vampire Hunter is one of the darkest, coolest characters that there is. So just to give you a wee bit of a background into, into who um, Blade actually is, his real name is Eric Brooks, and he was first introduced in the comics in 1973. So just at the end of the sort of the Silver Age of comics, they introduced this really cool character that, you know, he looked pretty suave. He actually, they, they modeled him on Jim Brown, the, the NFL player who, who went on to be an actor. And he looked really cool. And he looked badass. And, you know, I sort of thought that's the kind of character you, you think is going to he's going to save your life one day. So he, he was introduced in, a, in a, an issue called Tomb of Dracula. And it was issue 10. And it was in this issue that he was he was there to hunt down, as the title suggests, Dracula and kill Dracula. But obviously throughout those issues, it takes you into his origin and, and who he is and where he came and, and, and you know, what his basis was for, for becoming a superhero. So when he was born... His mum was a prostitute who lived in a who lived in a brothel, and it was during her pregnancy and her childbirth that a doctor she had a really really troublesome t childbirth, and a doctor who came out to to the the brothel um, was a guy called Deacon Frost. Now Deacon Frost, for people who are listening, is a name synonymous with Blade. Everybody knows Deacon Frost as the main villain to to Blade, really. But he comes to to. Um, to Blade's mum when she's given birth to Blade and at the point of her giving birth he actually bites her and he starts feeding over and as she like all great stories go that's the origin of where Blade gets part of his superpower so because he's feeding over part of his enzymes are blood and all, it all mixes together and it gives Blade has some of the superpowers that he you know he's came to, to be known for uh, and it was during this that he actually, the Deacon Frost killed his mum, and it was at that point that Blade obviously started the eventual mission to, at some point, kill Deacon Frost. Now, growing up, he learned the, the origins of what happened to him, uh, and it was through and uh, him and uh, his mentor, Afari, who took him through the process of sort of learning how to kill all vampires, how to fight vampires, how to be a vampire, essentially, because he's a he's a to, to give you an example, he's a bit like what Harry Potter is um, to Voldemort. He's the there's some there's a, an inherent link between the two of them. So he's a, called a, a dumpire, uh, and it was during this this time that he sort of mastered the technique of fighting. He he did all the things hand to hand combat, but he realized as well that he could use his powers as a tool for good. Uh, so he wasn't going to be somebody who was going to kill him the killing the masses he was going to help the the regular people so it was a nice it was a nice way to introduce him at a time i think when superheroes were just generally nothing wrong but like superman and batman just you know characters that you couldn't really relate to um, and i'm not saying it's easy to relate to a vampire hunter but i think he was more grounded in his backstory that you know he his parents were killed and it was through the that that really gave him his origin so that's when he was first introduced um and the two people that introduced him were, it's a, probably one of the most famous writers in comic book history for the dark and occult, a guy called Marv Wolfen. And he is known for doing some of the, the darkest sort of Dracula books and, and the scary stuff. And uh, Drew, the, the artist was called Gene Colan, who the two of them teamed up all the time for, for books like that. Uh, and it was just a perfect match to introduce 
a, a really cool character for Marvel. And to be honest, probably at the time, the edgiest thing Marvel had done. They tried a few bits and pieces, but you know, to introduce a character like that at that time, as say nineteen seventy three, was still quite early on for the superhero genre. So, um, but it really, really struck a chord. But through time, and I know we'll talk about it, they sort of dipped Blade in and out of the, the you know, the the, mar- the, the comics. He, he wasn't somebody who had massively long runs, but when they used him, they used him well. That that was the cool thing about Blade. Yeah, and you know, some of the research I had done uh, for the the release of the film, people were saying it was a you know, such an obscure character for them to base a film on at the time. I know Hollywood, you know, in the late 90s was buying up every comic property and, you know, sticking them in films just to make profit. But, you know, thinking of Marvel and thinking that you, you touched on it before, it is quite a dark tone. Would, would you agree with that? Would you say it's, you know, dark for our standards or? For sure. I mean, you know, as I say, when, when you say some of the highlights of Blade, his mum was a prostitute. He kills people. He, you know, he brutally kills people. Mm-hmm. He, when he gets attacked, his he can regenerate his body. You know, it's just it's it's all very very. It's not like when you talk about people like, you know, Spider Man, where it's a wee bit more light and fluffy at times. There, there's no light and fluff with this at all. It's all very very dark. And as I say, I think at the time, comic books in general were calling out for something that was a wee bit different. That was, as I say, more geared. Not, you know, comics are for everyone, but maybe geared towards a slightly older audience. Uh, and I think that that's very reflective in terms of when even the, the film came out with Wesley Snipes. You know, the film is full of blood, guts and gore. And to this day, you know, I still feel that that's one of the best Marvel films ever released. You know, and I think it was the first, in fact, it was the first film that was released in terms of Marvel comic book film, you know, properly that sort of started the whole fad before Spider-Man with, with Tobey Maguire. So as I say, the fact that they took a chance with Blade, you know, it was it was the right move at the time. And as I say, that film still holds a holds a candle for me as being yeah. one of the, the best representations of the comic book version um, mm-hmm. that there, there's been. And who are some of the sort of key writers and you know artists involved? You, you touched on his creator there, but have, have yeah. there been any other, you know, throughout history? Obviously, nineteen seventy three. What's that? Forty, fifty years of the character almost. You know, so. you know, since then, nobody's done it as well in my books. You know, mm-hmm. there, there's people who have obviously current Avengers run, for example, Jason Aaron. It's a great run, absolutely phenomenal run, and it's not a fo- the focus was never Blade, but one of the story arcs and it's only just recently went over there actually um the avengers actually have to free blade from a vampire horde and blade joins the avengers actually for a while in this again it's it's happened throughout time he's joined the you know a few different versions of the avengers he's been in the mid the midnight suns he's been in the night stalkers he's been in so many teams and all of those teams that he's been part of were part of like phenomenal creative teams at the time and it's the equivalent of you know putting as I said, it's essentially putting this, putting together the Justice League. That's what it was like for a lot of those teams. You know, yeah. Ghost Rider, you had Ghost Rider, Blade, you had Morbius. You had some really, really big, big characters joining up to fight off even more evil in them. So mm-hmm. um, some of the stories that, that, that were created by those, you know, by the, the, the creative teams then were fantastic. But as I say, the modern stuff by GS9 has been great with Blade. But mm-hmm. because there isn't an awful lot of stories with Blade, there, there really isn't. You know, if you go through his, his whole genre, you know, Apart from that, Tomb of Dracula run for 20 or 30 issues. After that, there's maybe only been 50 or 60 comics where he's appeared in them, which really isn't that much. You know, there's such a breadth of other characters. But what a, the, the most important thing about Blade is that the, the stories that they have done and the stories that they've done, they've told, such as the Midnight Suns, where the focus is about saving the world through supernatural and stuff. They have told them very, very well. They use them sparingly, but they use them very well. And it's it's one of the best things about Blade because for me as a retailer, for example, last year, was it last year? Last year, the year before, they released a comic called Blade vs. Wolverine. It was a one-shot, just a one-shot comic, just not much to it, 48 pages of just fighting, which was class. Mm-hmm. But the storyline was, was a nice wee storyline behind it. But they hadn't done a Blade story, solo Blade story in 10 years or something like that before that. And because of that, the amount of people that wanted to purchase it and wanted to jump on board just because they don't use the character that much. And that's why, you know, as I say, as an, it's sometimes nice to see underused characters because it does make them more 
far more interesting and it makes you sort of more excited to to get to see what the teams are doing with them yeah and you you touch on the uh the sort of dracula run you've touched on wolverine as well but are there any other you know for those of us who are maybe looking to dive a bit deeper into the character are there any other issues or, or sort of covers we should check out or what would you recommend the, the best so the best for obviously that tomb of dracula run is phen- phenomenal as i said it takes you through his origin and it takes you through his childhood, which is it's it's quite a sad. I mean, his whole story, his whole backstory is is terrible, just shockingly sad. You know, obviously from his mum getting brutally murdered to him sort of growing up as an orphan and getting taken under a fairy's wing. But then a fairy gets killed off by by Dracula, and he has to then go on. You know, it's just everybody. He's always seems to touch bad luck. But after that, there was a run, and I think the first solo run he had. And it was brilliant, absolutely brilliant. It was just called Blade the Vampire Hunter, nineteen ninety four. It started, and that was what's that? Twenty years after his, after his sort of his introduction. So it took twenty years to get him a solo run, and it was very well received. Very well received. Had one of the the most iconic covers for a comic book. It was one of the first times that Foy was used on a cover as well. So it's it's, it's class actually. It's Blade stand there with his. He's got his two blades standing there with the, the really cool outfit and in big silver holographic, it says Blade the Vampire Hunter. And it is as iconic. You know, everybody knows the cover. But that that storyline only ran for 10 issues. It was such a short run um, for being his first solo run. But because they were going to be putting him into the Midnight Suns and because they, they had bigger plans for Blade, they cut the run short. Um, but again, that was probably the... It's probably been the best run I've read of Blade for the fact that it does delve into his origin more so than anything else. It gives you a really good understanding of the character. So if you are looking to sort of deep dive into the character, that's what I would check it. Yes, of course, if you can get your hands on the first appearance, but it's very expensive now to get that uh, to get that first appearance of Blade. So if, you, if you're looking for something to sort of delve into, that's the place to go in the, the 1994 run. Yeah, okay. And you mentioned there as well when that came out, everybody, you know, with a... Blade versus Wolverine one shot. Everybody wanted it. I mm-hmm. imagine you know with the likes of the, the MCU films releasing, you know Disney Plus has a different series for us every three months. Do you see that effect coming through the industry? So say when when this new reboot of Blade comes out, can you imagine there will be a, a large demand for all that back stuff and you know backstory and does it sort of boost the industry as well with all people wanting to sort of jump in and learn more about the characters. Oh, 100%. You know, uh, I'm very lucky in, in my job that I'm surrounded by probably the best source material in the world. Uh, it's literally, uh, you know, that's maybe can be disputed slightly, but for me, it's the best source material and it's the best wealth of material that you can never get sick of. And it's lovely whenever a character, especially, you know, using somebody like Guardians of the Galaxy, Guardians was a team when it was introduced on the big screen that nobody had really heard of. Nobody knew who the Guardians of the Galaxy were. Again, as a comic reader from when I was five, you know, I'm not going to be one of these hipsters. I knew all about them. Obviously, through the shop, I would have had a fair idea, but there weren't a, a run that I was massively familiar with. But because they used under underused and underutilized characters, it meant that they could explore more and do a bit more because there was no expectation level. And I think that that's going to, that will run off and uh, whenever Blade does come out eventually, whenever that, I think it's supposed to be next year or the year after. Great casting for it for sure, but I think that it's going, it, it's 100%, there'll be another Blade run. The comics are very clever in putting runs out just before or just after film because they know that the fans of the films are going to come in the comic shops and say, where did Blade come from? Can you tell me a bit more about Blade? What's the best story? So if they introduce a, a new run or if they put a new run out just after the film, they know they're going to get good traction with it. So I have no doubt when the film's released that there'll be another six-part miniseries will be released or another one-shot, and it'll do extremely well because people will absolutely bolt for it. That's just the nature of it's the nature of the world at the minute. And I've seen it with every film that's come out, you know, and every film that's optioned on Netflix, or so whether it be... You know, things like Mac Cadet, you, whether it be, you can name anything actually on Netflix the minute, it always seems to be based on the comic book film or based on a comic book. So it's been great for us as, a, as an industry because it's definitely getting more people, more feet through the doors and more eyes on the books, which is most important to me. Um, but, you know, for bringing it back to Blade, you know, whenever it is released, of course, it will have that impact because people will want to know more. They will want to find out, you know, who he is and 
now there'll be a lot of people who will very very you will know all his background because there isn't that much as i say to know but there'll be a load of new people there'll be a hundred you know there'll be loads of new people who'll come in and go um i really like the look of that new blade series can you get me on that and it's a great thing that that comics have that appeal and it's great that the films and the comics now link up so well my only thing is that the comics should be where the source starts it shouldn't be the comics taken from the films it should be the films taken from the comics and that's that's most important to me so uh you know they've done i think they've done blade very well first time around so fingers crossed they do the same again to be honest i'll be completely honest any version that i've ever seen of blade on screen has been always been done very well the wesley snipes version was class the animated spider-man when he was in that was one of the that was one of my earliest memories actually as a kid I, I loved that show and blade and it was like i remember saying fuck that isn't blade class i didn't curse at him now to be fair but um <laughs> i used to remember blade was always a character when you're sitting there on saturday going god i hope blade's gonna be in this episode he's just such a cool character but so they've always done him justice so i can't see them not doing him justice now with, with maharsh ali but time will tell so yeah. we'll, i'm looking forward to it uh but yeah as long as the, the 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 draw from the source material it can't go too far wrong yeah cool. well the one final thing i would sort of ask in that you know we we're hearing rumors about the i know we're, we're talking a lot about the mcu and you know the way the next doctor strange film is going to be more of a horror you know oriented film do you reckon they'll go down that line with Blade? Do you think they could do a you know a nineteen nineties Blade film now in that universe with the blood and the gore and that storyline, or how do you think they should approach it? Do you know, I was actually I haven't watched Blade. I haven't watched it in, in a few years, but uh, you know it's a film that because it's obviously on the festival, I certainly will go and see it. But uh, I don't know whether you could get away with doing. The Blade film as it was in 97 and 98 now, you know, even the first, I remember the opening scene, it was in a, was it a nightclub or a, mm-hmm. it was just a nightclub and he was just lopping heads off and you couldn't get away with that nowadays. Now, thankfully, in the last two, three years, Marvel have obviously, I think it was Logan was the first one to do it. They put the R rating on, on some some films now and, you know, Deadpool's going to get that R rating from, through, I think it's going to be the first Disney film to get an R rating. But because they have set a precedent where they can do stuff that's a wee bit darker, that's a bit more brutal, because as dark as Blade is, it's also brutal as anything. You know, as I say, the, the lop on the heads, cutting off of arms, the blood. Blood is one of the most important parts of a vampire story, so you need to see it. Um, Blade likes to paint the town red. Usually, he <laughs> paints it quite a bit. And because of that, you need to have blood, guts, and gore. Yeah. If it had been filmed five, ten years ago, I don't think they could have done it right. But as I say, because they've, they've seen, they've realized that there's a massive audience for the, as you quite rightly say, the horror sort of side or the darker side, I think they will, they'll have to give it some form of an R rating or at least a quite a, a high rating. Um, but by doing so, it means they can go balls to the wall and completely, you know, make it the blade that it should be. So as I say, it's a shame that Wesley Snipes isn't gonna i don't know if he'll be involved in some way but um as i say he was the perfect he was legitimately blade he was the perfect choice for the casting at the time his his frame his look his manner his demeanor everything about him you know i remember seeing him a demolition man thinking this is the guy this is he's perfect for it so i think that if they get marshall ali to be in that sort of same stocky frame and the same sort of mold as as wesley snipes for it he can he can do some damage that's for sure so i think yeah i do i think the horror side to it is certainly something that they're going to have to do i think that if they didn't it wouldn't be doing the character justice and i i get the feeling now that marvel they do listen to what the fans have to say because they know that that's that you know it's putting money in their pockets so i, I do think that that it will be on the, the darker side of things for sure yeah no that, that's great and, we, and you're certainly looking forward to that whether it be next year or the year after but um i think that's about all we have time for at the moment so um thank you aaron for giving us your insight into the character of blade um yeah. and just to remind everyone that we can you can check the, f- the first film out on saturday the 30th of october at the movie house cinema city side it's part of our festival so thanks again aaron and thank you everyone for watching thanks <laughs>